Hello everyone, welcome to Tuesday here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. I'm Glenn, it's great to have you with us. We are gonna be talking today about one of my personal favorite time periods in history, the War of 1812. Now, I'm a military historian by trade, that's where a lot of my research and my degrees are in. And I know folks are not supposed to have a favorite war, but if we are going to have one, the War of 1812 is mine. Why is that? Well. It's a young America. It's America finding its way. Uh, it's wrapped up in the larger question of the Napoleonic Wars. And as you can see, the uniforms are just so darned cool and interesting looking. So we're going to jump right into it and get into what was the War of 1812 about? Why uh, did this thing happen? And you have to, one thing you have to keep in mind is for the early United States, Great Britain was always the enemy. Here in the, in the 20th century and in the 21st century, they're our allies. They're one of our, our closest friends. We share a common language. We share a common history. But during the American Revolution, of course, they were the ones we were rebelling against. They were the ones we were fighting to gain our independence from. And from the end of the war for the revolution, of course, we were always afraid that Great Britain was going to try to somehow come back and, and take us back over. And Great Britain to their part, were waiting for the United States to fail so that they could swoop back in and get all those uh, states that had formerly been colonies. And so the United States and Great Britain, even though they, again, shared a common language, a common past, and were very, very close trading partners, they sort of stared at each other across the Atlantic Ocean. And the Great Britain also became embroiled in that larger question and, and the larger situation of the French Revolutionary and then the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. And we talked a little bit about this in previously, but you have to remember the Napoleonic Wars are gigantic. They're basically the world war of their age. They spread across all of Europe, and Great Britain and France especially are in a war for survival of their nation. That's how they see it. And they're fighting each other very, very strongly. Well, here is the young United States and you have to remember, this is not the United States of today. We do not go from sea to shining sea in 1812. We're actually very small. We only go really to the Mississippi River, and there's a lot of land past that that does belong to the United States, but we haven't settled it. We haven't been able to take advantage of those resources. The United States is still very small, very young, and very dependent for its trade and its economic prosperity on being able to exchange goods with other countries. Now those countries are at war with each other. They don't want us to trade with their enemy. And so they each begin to put things in place that make it hard for the United States to stay neutral in this war. France, of course, wants those supplies from America. Great Britain wants those supplies from America. Great Britain has a navy. And that navy, of course, sails along the oceans. And for our goods to get to Europe, they have to go across the ocean, and Great Britain's Navy begins to stop that. Great Britain uses its ships, its warships, to board our peaceful merchant ships and stop them and keep them from going where they want. They also begin to take American sailors, who they believe may be British, and impress them or force them into serving in the British Navy. This causes a huge stir in the United States. The United States is also looking uh, to secure its borders both north and south, to the north with Canada, which has remained a British-controlled area. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said that taking Canada would be a mere matter of marching. So there was still that expansionist ideals from the United States. We also wanted to secure our southern borders from the Spanish, uh, from the British, and as well from Native American tribes that were oftentimes not necessarily friendly to the United States for for incredibly understandable reasons, but nevertheless, the United States, and especially those southern states like Georgia and Tennessee, saw threats from those Native Americans. And there was a large proportion of Congress that wanted this war to happen, called the War Hogs. We talked yesterday about John C. Calhoun and uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, folks like this wanted this war to go forward as a way to get America on that stage and prove what we were made of. And we thought that our militia and our, our army, our army proper, the way I'm dressed, was very, very small. But of course, in the United States, we considered every able-bodied male part of the national army. And we thought we would be able to, to totally beat Britain on land. 
we might have some trouble at sea. Well, to make a long story short, as it turned out, our sea forces, we only had six big ships, did pretty well against the British fleet. They did remarkably well. It, it totally took uh, Great Britain unawares how good those United States ships fought. On land, however, didn't go so well. Uh, again, the, the regular army, the ones who uh, had joined to create an actual army, were the ones who were well-trained, well-disciplined, well-supplied, and well-uniformed, and that's who I'm representing now. A little bit later, I'm going to get into the details of the uniforms and the soldier life, but right now, let me put up on the screen uh, just a, a map of the Northern Theater, the War in the North. All right, so let's see what that would be titled. I think it's called War in the North. All right, perfect. There we go. <laughs> let's see. So, so I'm not going to get into detail, but you can see the, the Great Lakes are over here, and <clears throat> these lakes, these waterways, were, were considered natural invasion routes to go into the north, into Canada. And so we kept trying again and again to get into Canada, to march our forces north, and they kept getting stopped every time. Like I said, our naval forces did well, but our land forces somehow continued to get beat time after time. So we would try to, to come up the lakes here, go across here. We would try to come up the uh, St. Excuse me, the so yes, the St. Lawrence, and this uh, quarter from the Hudson going up to the St. Lawrence River. We keep trying to get in there, but we don't. Our armies do terribly because they're not very well disciplined, they're not very large, and they're very, very poorly supplied. So after the first year and a half or so of war, the United States actually sees itself subject to defeat after defeat from the British. The British perspective is that the United States is somewhat ungrateful to its mother country. Here is Great Britain in a life struggle with the forces of revolutionary France and with the Emperor Napoleon, and here we are. They, they called us even Brother Jonathan. That was their derogatory name for the Americans. Brother Jonathan was over here trying to cause trouble, trying to take land, while Great Britain had bigger things on its mind, and it's not able to send as many forces to the United States to fight. So they, uh, they finally get a hold, um, again, I'm going to have to sum up very quickly, they finally get Napoleon under control, but it takes the British, the Spanish, the Austrians, the Russians, the Prussians, all fighting against uh, France. They finally defeat him, and it finally defeat Napoleon in 1814 at the Battle of Leipzig. It's called the Battle of Nations. It's one of the largest battles that had ever taken place in Europe until that time. And he is sent into exile on the island of Elba, and it looks like the war is over in Europe which allows Great Britain time to turn its attention to its troublesome neighbor across the ocean, the United States. And it takes these veteran soldiers that had been fighting in Spain, and it decides to have an expedition to go forth and attack the United States. And they do an incredibly good job. They sail into the Chesapeake Bay. They land near our capital of Washington, D.C. They march into the capital after a battle where they swept aside the American forces at the Battle of Bladensburg, well known for how, how much the Americans ran. As a matter of fact, the British called it the Bladensburg Races. And they marched into Washington, D.C., and in the middle of this gigantic thunderstorm, they set fire to the White House, they burned the White House, they burned the Capitol, and it looks like there are even more British soldiers on the way. This is what we call War of 1812 bad. Imagine that your president has had to run away, that all of your armies are defeated, that one of the most successful and powerful armies on the face of the planet is now in your capital, burning it and looking to, to punish you for what you had done. They then march to Baltimore, and they are going to take Baltimore because Baltimore is not the capital, but it's a very important economic center. It's a large port, and a lot of businesses and people live there. And they try to march their armies there, and they try to take it with a naval blockade. Oh, they pull all of their naval, sh naval ships and begin to bombard a place called Fort McHenry in, in Baltimore there. And a song comes from this, and I bet you've heard it. It is our national anthem today, the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming. This was written by Francis Scott Key, 
as he watched the bombardment of the British ships against the American Fort McHenry. He didn't know if the fort was going to last, and, and he's writing this poem about the incredibly patriotic spirit that he has when the dawn comes and he sees the star-spangled banner still flying above the fort. And this gives hope to the Americans, and this poem immediately goes across the country, and the British are not able to go into Baltimore, and they have to leave. And during this attack on Baltimore, their greatest um, uh, general, General Brock, is actually killed uh, by an American sniper who's climbed up in a tree. And so this British force now says, well, we need to go somewhere else in the United States and punish them and see if we can't win this war. So they decide to go uh, eventually to New Orleans. But I want to back up a minute before we get to the Battle of New Orleans and talk a little bit about other things that were going on during the War of 1812 here in the Southeast. This is the part of the war that most folks don't remember. And it began really as a civil war between Indians that belonged to the Creek Nation. The Muscogee Nation had been fighting each other over whether they were going to assimilate and work with the United States citizens or not. And those who did not want to cooperate with the Americans were called Red Sticks. And the Red Sticks began to raid forts, they began to raid farms, they uh, massacred a large number of people at a place called Fort Mims in the south of what is now Alabama. Ironically, there were actually more Creek Indians killed there than white people, but the Red Sticks didn't care. They were looking to assert their authority. And to address this issue, the states of Georgia and Tennessee decided to build their militias and march their militias into the territory to punish these Creek Indians and defeat them in battle. The first forces that were ready were actually from Georgia. From a, a fellow named General Floyd led the Georgia forces and fought the largest conglomeration of Creek warriors at a place called Atossi and defeated them. But he was wounded, his men received a lot of hurts, and so he had to go back into Georgia, which left it to the Tennessee militia. Now, the Tennessee militia were led by a man that I bet most of you have heard of, Andrew Jackson. So Andrew Jackson was a prominent Tennessee lawyer. He was a uh, general of the Western Tennessee militia. He had uh, been a senator. He was a very prominent man, but he wasn't nationally well known. Well, this campaign that he takes the Tennessee militia to fight against the Creeks does show that he is po uh, capable of national popularity. He marches south and builds a series of forts. He fights a series of battles until he finally surrounds the, the, the last Creek warriors at a place called Tallapoosa or Horseshoe Bend. It's a bend um, on the Tallapoosa River. It looks like a horseshoe. I think we have Jackson's map that he actually drew of this battle. Let's see. So we have Horseshoe Bend. Horseshoe Bend, that's it. So, so here's, a, here's the, the map that Jackson actually drew himself after the battle. And you can see the Tallapoosa River and where it goes in a horseshoe right through here. And the Creeks had fortified, they had built a village in the crook of this river and built a barricade across it right here. And so Jackson's forces, which are mostly militia, have to attack this. He has two cannons, but he also has a regiment of United States regulars, the 39th U.S. Infantry. He has a lot of Tennessee forces, and he has some famous people that take part in this war. David Crockett is part of the Tennessee militia that comes and fights against the Creeks. Uh, Sam Houston is in the 39th U.S. Infantry, and he will, of course, go on to become the father of the Texas Republic, but right now he's just an officer in this, in this uh, unit, and he is one of the first officers over the wall, and he is badly wounded. When these men finally attack, uh, they go over the wall, they have the help of the Cherokee Indians. Yes, the Cherokee are fighting with Andrew Jackson against another Native American tribe. Again, the politics and, and the, and, and the uh, interactions are very complex and very interesting in this time. The Cherokee are really the key to Jackson's victory. They go behind that horseshoe and they begin to swim across and attack it from the rear at the same time that Jackson's army is attacking from the front. And so they're able to totally overwhelm the Creeks at Horseshoe Bend, and it is actually, for Native Americans, the deadliest single day in American history. 
uh, they lose uh, between seven and 800 warriors on that day, and it totally defeats them. And the Creek Nation is forced to sign the Treaty of Fort Jackson, with which they give up a large amount of territory. I think we have a, another graphic to show you how much territory they give up. Treaty of Fort Jackson, I think it's called. So you can see the modern states of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. The area in orange is how much land the Creeks had to give away because they had been defeated by Andrew Jackson. And this is the Treaty of Fort Jackson. Look how much land this is. It's a good part of Georgia. It's most of the modern state of Alabama. So they are forced to surrender a huge amount of land. This victory over the Native Americans coupled with this new property that the United States owns makes Jackson famous throughout the entire country. And even though things have not been going very well in the North, Jackson himself is seen as someone who is a successful general, who can lead troops in battle and win. This becomes incredibly important. And as a result, he's placed in charge not only of the Tennessee militia, but of the entire Southwestern military district, which includes New Orleans. And of course, he realizes he gets information that the British are heading to the Gulf of Mexico. Maybe they're going to attack Mobile. Maybe they're going to attack New Orleans. So he is the one who leads the armies at New Orleans. And again, you have to remember, the British are incredibly powerful. Just because they had to leave our capital and come down south doesn't mean they're defeated. They still have a very effective army. They still have the greatest navy in the world. They still have the most experienced generals. And they're going to attack New Orleans, which is incredibly important because it controls all the trade on the Mississippi River. Well, the British land and Jackson immediately attacks them in a night battle, which totally takes the British by surprise and they're not sure what to do. Jackson has two regiments this time of U.S. regulars, the 44th and the 7th U.S. Infantry. And these forces are really the core of his army, but his army is probably one of the most diverse that the United States had ever fielded at that point. We have uh, white Americans, we have free blacks, there are slaves, there are Choctaws, there are Creoles and Cajuns. Uh, they are coming from everywhere to fight in this army on the plains of Chalmette, which is the name of the plantation. And this is actually where I'm standing. What you see behind me is called Line Jackson. This was a defensive fortification that he built. He threw up a trench and created a, a, a stockade, and he put artillery, he put cannon at different intervals along this line. And it was those cannons that made it a very, very secure position. Those cannons turn into giant shotguns and can send out hundreds of, of little lead or iron balls at once every time they fire. The British realize that they have to attack, they have to win this battle, and so they set up their best soldiers and they go to the attack. And through a, a tragedy of errors and through a miscommunication galore, they're not able to get their attack going the way they want to. And all of those cannons and all of those men uh, at Line Jackson totally obliterate the British Army and they give it one of the worst defeats it's ever suffered. So bad that after a couple of days, uh, the, the general who's left in command, Pakenham, Pakenham was killed at the battle. His second in command decides that they need to go ahead and leave. They get back on their ships and they sail to England because they had gotten word that a peace treaty had been signed between the British and the Americans the day before Christmas on New Year's Eve, excuse me, on Christmas Eve on December 24th in England. It had taken that long for word to get to the United States that the war was officially over, and the battle was fought on January 8, 1815, which means the battle was technically fought after the peace treaty had been signed, but that isn't too important because what that meant was America was certainly able to make sure that the terms of the peace treaty were followed. Now, that in a nutshell is the course of the War of 1812. There's so much more to it, but you have to remember that America is really trying to build up an army that it hadn't had before. During the American Revolution, even, people were afraid of a standing army because a standing army was expensive, which means taxes had to be high. A standing army could be used to go into different countries, 
and attack, a standing army could be used to oppress the population. Why did Americans think this way? Because that's what the British Army had done in the colonies before the American Revolution. And so we were very nervous about a standing uniformed army. But for the, when the War of 1812 came, we had to build it up very, very quickly. And so you had to create uniforms, you had to train these men. Now, let's talk a little bit about this uniform. So you see the uniform I have here. This is not what you would call a camouflage uniform. This is not um, a very effective uniform for running and jumping and things like that. It's made of wool, as all uniforms are at this time, because wool will keep you warm even when things are wet. You could get rained on and this will keep you warm. Notice how it has a very high collar. Notice it has a very tall hat and it has this pom-pom over here. Um, the coat even has tails, sort of a short version of the dress coats of the day. Why are soldiers going to be dressed in such a fancy way that doesn't seem very practical for battle? This is the time, especially during the Napoleonic era, when soldiers are supposed to look good. You want your soldiers to be firm and crisp and stand up straight and have very nice uniforms. And they all have shiny buttons and they have these, um, the pieces of metal. They've got the plate on the hat. They have the plate on the cross belts that are all going to make for a very nice looking soldier who's also able to fight. Now, the weapon that he has is um, this, which is basically a, a French design, but it's a single shot, muzzle loading musket, just like all the armies have at this time. So you have to load it one round at a time to fire it. It also has a bayonet that can turn it into a big pointy stick. So this big pointy stick can be used to fight against people to, to hold the line. And again, this doesn't look too impressive with just me and a single musket. You have to imagine hundreds and hundreds of my fellow soldiers standing side by side, ready to take the attack. Boom! <laughs> so that can be a very, very effective and frightening thing. Um, the soldiers are all going to have to carry everything they need to fight, everything they need to eat, everything they need to survive. So I have my bayonet carrier that I keep my bayonet in. I have my cartridge box, which is a leather box that I keep all of my ammunition in. The soldier's also going to carry this on their back, a knapsack with a blanket and perhaps some spare clothes, um, perhaps just some small comfort things, but not their food. Their food goes in just this plain bag, just this white bag called a haversack. And the haversack is what they're going to put their rations in. And just like, or very similar to our Civil War soldier, they're going to join up and sort of combine the rations that they get and cook them all at once. But one of the main rations, also similar to our Civil War soldier, is going to be this hard biscuit. Now this one's round because this is called ship's biscuit. This is something that was developed for long voyages to last a long time and it's round they would put this in barrels, just layer and layer and layer, and all it is is flour and water and a little bit of salt. And folks at home, if you want to, uh, while you're at home, if you want to try some very interesting cooking, you can go online. There are several recipes for hardtack. You might want to make some and see what it's like. That's something that's going to be really easy, doesn't take much flour, there's plenty of water out there, and you can see um, just what kind of food the soldiers may have had. Now, soldiers are also going to need to carry water in a canteen. Soldiering, marching, fighting is thirsty work. And this is just a, it's just a wooden canteen, sort of a, they called it a cheese box because it was two pieces of wood with another piece of wood wrapped around. And you could fill it up there with a hole and just plug it back up and then carry it on you. So a soldier's life is going to be pretty easy. His equipment is going to be pretty simple but there's a lot of marching to it. Now, there were always more militia than regular soldiers. These regular soldiers are going to all be dressed in some type of uniform. The militia or the volunteers may have a much more basic uniform, or they may have no uniform at all. They may have weapons they've brought from home. They may have weapons issued to them 
by the government or by the state governments. But they're all going to be working together and they're all going to be trying to fight against the invaders and the British. Now, when the war ends, even though the United States, why had they gotten into it? They had wanted to stop British ships from seizing American ships and American sailors. They wanted to conquer Canada. They wanted to assert American power throughout the world. Well, when the peace treaty was signed, the British agreed, had already agreed to stop attacking British, uh, excuse me, American vessels. They, uh, everyone agreed that things would go back to the way they were before the war. The fancy term for that is status quo antebellum, which means just the same way things were. So there's no taking Canada. We don't get any territory. They don't get any territory. And there's really nothing that stops other than peace is declared. But one of the biggest effects this had on the United States is that for the first time it created a national spirit. Before this, many people had been men from Massachusetts or from Connecticut or Virginia or Georgia or the Carolinas, but the War of 1812 created something that bound the nation together in a single experience. And the defeats as well as the victories during the war was the first time that everyone who was a citizen who participated in this time felt like they were an American. They were part of a national spirit and a national dream. And moving forward from the War of 1812, that really started to define what it was to be from the new United States. You were not focused on the states you were from. You were focused on being an American. An American that had fought for their independence, that had secured their independence, again, during the War of 1812 from the British. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully, Libba, we've got all sorts of great questions about this. Oh, yes. So, um, we have Elizabeth, who's eight years old, wants to know how long did battles go on? Ah, Elizabeth, uh, that's a good question. Wants to know how long did the battles go on? So, let's see. Uh, the naval battles on ship didn't usually last more than a day. Some of them lasted less. Uh, on land, it really depended upon how good the different soldiers were on each side and if one side had an advantage over the other. Some of the battles could go several, several hours all day long. Uh, the Battle of New Orleans lasted only about an hour and a half. And that's from the very beginning to the very end. So it wasn't a, a single type of, of length of time that was typical for a battle, but never did a battle usually last more than one day. If one side began to beat the other one, the one who was being beat tended to begin to surrender, tended to begin to run away. And once one side had a very distinct and important advantage, that was it. The battle was not going to last much longer than that. Susan wants to know, do you participate in any reenactments? And is there a reenactment of the uh, War of 1812? Oh, yes. So uh, Susan wants to know if I participate in reenactments and if they have reenactments, reenactments of the War of 1812, they do. Uh, they're not as large as the American Civil War. That's much more popular. But there are smaller uh, reenactments around the country for the War of 1812. And the flavor of them sometimes can be focused on which region. Up in the north, they're focused around, you know, Fort Niagara and things like that and the invasions of Canada. Uh, there are some here closer to the south. Uh, there are even some battlefields here close to the south. There's one at Horseshoe Bend is now a national military battlefield park. And you can go visit there. Uh, every year they have some sort of living history, and there, there's often people there. Uh, back in 2015, they had probably what was the biggest War of 1812 reenactment in America, which was the 200th anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans. And I and some of my good pards were there to take part in that. Can you talk about what happens at a reenactment? <laughs> well, uh, the question is, what happens at a reenactment? Um, Lots of different things. Uh, sometimes the, to make it work, the men who are going to be fighting or pretending to fight as a, at a reenactment, uh, they're going to have to practice those drills together and learn to march, learn to work as a unit just exactly like the soldiers back then did. Now, we only have a few hours to do it as opposed to weeks and weeks, so we may not be as, as smooth or as uh, precise as some of those guys. Uh, but we're going to wear our uniforms. We're going to have meal times as close as uh, style and type of food that they did back then. 
And one of the, the, there's really two types of ways to do this. There's a reenactment, which is the battle that takes place that the public can come and see and sort of watch a in live action pretend battle. But fortunately, there's no blood or guts or anything like that. It's just sort of a pretend. But the part I really enjoy is the living history part. So we'll be in camp. We'll be practicing our drill. We'll be having some of our equipment in our tents and people will just sort of walk through the camps and walk through the areas to, to learn, to see what life might have been like back then for soldiers. Um, and that was one of the great things at the 200th anniversary of New Orleans is when there was a British camp and an American camp and it was open to the public. So you don't have to get your clothes and pretend to be a soldier. If you just want to go see some of these, a lot of them are open to the public. So if you're really interested, I strongly recommend that you sort of look around and find the next one that's close to you and just go check it out. Katie wants to know, did Britain know about America's idea for manifest destiny? <laughs> uh, the question is, did the British know about the American idea for manifest destiny? Now, manifest destiny proper didn't really kick in until we began to realize that maybe we could expand past the Mississippi River. To be honest, if you want to look at it a certain way, Great Britain started the idea of Manifest Destiny because when they landed and developed colonies such as Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, when they granted charters or permission for where these colonies would actually be, they said, well, it'll start here, it'll be on the coast, and it'll go up so far and go so far, and then it will go as far that way until it hits the Pacific Ocean. They had never even explored this, but they were just saying, you get all that land. So the idea was, from the beginning, to take the land, hold it for a country, and be able to use its natural resources. Now, the British and the Spanish certainly were aware of America's desire to continue to expand westward, especially after the Louisiana Purchase, because the Spanish and the British both considered that to be an illegal and illegitimate purchase. Neither one of them had agreed to it. It had been, of course, with Napoleon, who was now defeated. But nevertheless, Great Britain did see trouble on the horizon with a country that kept growing and kept growing. Um, so why were the Native Americans in Louisiana referred to as the Red Sticks? That's a good question. So why were the, uh, the Indians in Louisiana referred to as, as Red Sticks? Not necessarily Louisiana. The ones we're talking about are in the Mississippi and Alabama territories, which of course now are mostly the state of Alabama. And the Red Sticks were a particular faction that believed in fighting against the spread of American politics, society, and especially economy into traditional Native American lifestyles and traditional American lands. Some people, some Native Americans did want to work with the Americans as much as possible. It meant prosperity. It meant education. It meant peace. But those who wanted to maintain their traditional roles uh, were willing to fight for it, and that means, of course, violence. And the red sticks, the red stick was sort of the symbol of, um, uh, what am I trying to say? In, 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 particular, in this particular uh, Creek culture, picking up the red stick meant that you were going to go to war. That meant that you, were, that you had symbolically decided that you were going to fight for a particular cause or, or what have you. So these, these Indians were known as the Red Sticks. Okay. Sophia, who is 11, would like to know what the metal thing is hanging from your uniform. Ah, Sophia, uh, that's a good eagle eye. I always wait to get this question about what this dangly thing is that's hanging from my uniform. Let me come a little closer and show you. Um, this is a whisk and a pick. So it hangs from my uniform and it has a small, like a brush here, and then it has a, a long, thin, I don't know if you can see that, piece of metal right there. And I have that so that when I am firing my musket, the type of powder we use can, can be very dirty. So I will use this to brush away, to sort of clean that and brush it, and then the little pick part to clean the touch hole so that my weapon will continue to fire. It's really a small, handy, personal musket maintenance tool. That's what that is. 
Uh, and of course it's hanging here so that when I'm firing, the, the, the musket's going to be here a lot of times, so I'll be able to reach down and use it, and it's always there where I need it. But, but that's a good eye that you, that you saw that. Leslie wants to know how the soldiers slept and where. Ah. Uh, Leslie would like to know how the soldiers slept and where they slept and where they slept. So sometimes there were tents uh, that they could set up to keep the weather off of them, keep the sun, keep the rain. But inside the tent um, was the ground. And so they might lay on the ground. They might have a blanket. If they were lucky and if they were willing to bear the weight in their knapsack, they might carry two blankets. That's if they had a tent. More often than not, when they were marching and on campaign, the soldiers are just going to take off their equipment, lay on the ground, and go to sleep. So how many of you have, on a camping trip, just gone outside, found a nice comfy spot in the woods, and just laid on the ground and slept for eight hours? Probably not very many of you, but that was a very, very common thing for soldiers of all sides uh, to, to have to experience. Oh, determined who won. So which battle was the... Ah, so, so Tali wanted to know which battle determined who won the war. So there wasn't really a single battle that determined that. I think what happened was, but to, you're, you're kind of on the right track, the problem was there was no single battle that determined who was going to win, if that makes sense. Neither side was able to defeat the other in such a way that they would be able to say, well, you have to surrender because we've beaten you so bad. New Orleans did assure American victory. It was a huge, huge victory for the Americans and a big defeat for the British. But again, the peace treaty had already been signed and whether or not the British would have kept going if the treaty had not been signed is, is guesswork. It's up in the air. The odds are they probably would not have. Um, Remember, England had just been through 20 years, 20 years of expensive, bloody, horrible war all over Europe. And the last thing they're going to want to do is maintain that war when there's no reason. And that was one of the biggest reasons that the Treaty of Ghent was signed, because no one really saw a reason to go on fighting. There was nothing to be gained given how much it was going to take to actually win. So to answer your question, no single battle determined the outcome of the war because there was no battle where someone won so big they could dictate terms to someone else. How much time did it take to load a musket? Ah, so how much time? The question is how much time did it take to load a musket? Uh, the common belief, the common knowledge is that a good soldier could load and fire their musket about three times a minute. Let me, uh, let me sort of go ahead and, and show you how that would happen. So, like I said, you've got your cartridge box. I'm not actually going to load and fire because that would be smoky and messy, but I will show you that the, uh, each little cartridge, it's a little tube of paper, and in the tube of paper is a lead ball and the gunpowder, right? So, to load the musket, I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to face this way. So I'm going to uh, be at attention, and they're going to tell me to prime and load. So I'm going to open this pan, and I'm going to come around and take one of those paper cartridges out of my cartridge box and bring it up, and I'm going to use my teeth to tear it open. And then I'm going to pour a little bit into this small pan and then shut it, okay? Then I'm going to come around this way, and I'm going to pour that powder from that paper tube down the barrel, then I'm going to put the ball down the barrel and draw my ramrod and push that, bow, that ball and powder all the way down. And then I'm going to put that back and then I'm going to come up like this. Now remember, all of my friends next to me are doing this and when they see everyone standing like this, they'll know that everyone's ready and they'll say, make ready, take aim, Fire! Boom! And then they'll come back down and start the whole process over again. Now I was going kind of slow to show you what the motions are, are like, but again, about three, 
Three times a minute is how often we could fire our muskets. Oh, um, let me turn around. You can see all those buttons on the back of the coat. The quick and easy answer is for show. Um, the only really practical buttons that do anything on this coat are the ones that button up through here. Uh, all the ones on the collar, all the ones on the cuff, the ones on the tail, they're all, um, they're, they're sort of decoration. And these, these coats, again, this is about sort of looking good and looking sharp and, and soldier-like. Uh, even the gaiters I have on my feet, um, around my legs, each one of those has 15 buttons. So I'm wearing right now almost 60 pewter buttons on this single uniform. So it's a lot of buttons, but it sure does look good. Was the Battle of Tippecanoe in the War of 1812? Uh, was the Battle of Tippecanoe in the War of 1812? That was... Oh, that was not exactly in the War of 1812. That was a little bit before, but it was connected. Um, the Battle of Tippecanoe was where they, uh, the U.S. Army was having to fight against a uh, Tecumseh and some of his native warriors who were trying to unite all of the Indians in the western part of the country. And see, this, is, this was really the biggest problem the Indians had is they could never unify and all decide to come together in a big army and decide what to do. There were lots of different tribes and nations and councils and villages that, that could never unify under a single voice. This is what they were trying to do, and Tippecanoe is really the battle where they were able to stop that movement, even though some of it had already taken root and had been a big influence on the Red Stick Creeks in Alabama. Um, did, the question is, did the soldiers have shields or any other weapons? Um, not really. Uh, the, the, uh, the American soldiers, the British soldiers, are almost exclusively going to have a musket and a bayonet. That's going to be their weapon. Uh, the officers are going to have swords and perhaps pistols. Now, the Native American soldiers, if they can get a hold of them, are also going to have muskets, but we have records of them using bows and arrows uh, numerous bows and arrows, maybe even a spear here and there. But by and large, everyone, uh, all of the uh, American British forces are going to have muskets, and most of the Native Americans are going to have muskets too, and if not, they're going to have bows and arrows. They're, this is beyond the point where they're going to use a lot of shields because a shield's not going to protect you from a bayonet or a musket ball, so it's just going to be an extra weight that won't do you any good that you'll have to carry. I can talk a little bit about the cannons. So, um, so the, the cannons you see behind me um, are big tubes. They're, they're sort of big, big muskets, right? They still have to be loaded from the muzzle. Uh, and, and rather than one person, it takes a crew. Uh, it can take as many as 12 to 15 men to operate one cannon. And they have to be carefully loaded because you saw my paper cartridge, right? That small paper cartridge that had the gunpowder. Well, the cannons work a little bit the same, but their cartridges are, are very big. Some of their cartridges might have an entire pound, pound and a half of powder. That's that much gigantic explosive power, and you don't want to have a mistake or an accident when you're handling that much explosive with your hand. So everyone has to work very closely as a team, and everyone has to do their specific job, and the cannon has to be loaded over and over. Uh, they would even wet the inside of the cannon between each shot so that sparks would not set off the, the gunpowder before it was time to set it off. And like I said, these are, these, are, um, these are big shotguns. They can fire solid shot, you know, three pound, six pound balls that are just are going to sometimes skip along the ground, go through several men at once if they're all in line. Uh, or they can be the giant shotgun effect where they have all those small lead balls, so they can be very, very effective. And at New Orleans, even though the legend says that it's those Kentucky and Tennessee riflemen that inflicted most of the casualties on the British, a close reading of the sources does not indicate that. Rather, it looks like very much it was the cannon and the artillery that inflicted most of the wounds and the casualties on the British forces because 
there were just so many cannons firing continuously and the British soldiers were never able to get up to those cannons to stop them. Did the Americans expect to take all of Canada or just part of Canada? Uh, the, Ameri the question is, did the Americans expect to take all of Canada or part of Canada? Canada is an interesting place at this time. It was sort of the same thing in the French and Indian War. And, and we also tried to take it, if you'll remember, during the American Revolution. The thing with Canada is, uh, especially at this time, if you can take the major cities and the, that, that lie along the major waterways, you have, in effect, taken all of Canada. So the real targets in Canada are Montreal, Quebec, um, and any of the Great Lakes. If you can capture the water, because those waterways are to them what the, the interstates and the highways are to us. It's how people and cargo moved back and forth. So if you could control that, you can control the entire rest of the land. So yes, the goal was to take all of Canada, but not to occupy that whole landmass, just to take those particular cities so that they could control it. Did the locals go out to see the battles? Uh, the question is, did the locals go out to see the battles? Um, some of them may have tried. Often, especially you know when, it, when you're being called up for militia, you're not going to be watching the battle, you're going to be participating in the battle, right? If, you're, if the militia is called up, you're supposed to be in it. And unless you're very, very sure that your side's going to win, you don't want to go anywhere near that battle because you know that there are stray bullets and, and cannon shells and everything bouncing around that may get you. Um, so there were not a lot of spectators. Uh, the question is, did David Crockett fight in the war? He did participate in the Creek War, in Jackson's War against the Creek Indians. Um, he was in uh, a couple of, of battles, but he was mostly used because of his excellent... Um, and this is before he became a congressman. This is just when he was plain old David Crockett. Uh, because of his excellent hunting skills, he was usually sent out to hunt to get meat for the officers or for the other men. He didn't really participate in, in, a, in any large battle. That wasn't sort of why he was there. But he did march along with the armies. Uh, he did see some action, and he did participate in, uh, in the Creek War. Ben, who is five, wants to know what kind of ships were in the battle. I'll see. Ben, uh, you want to know what kind of ships were in the battle? Uh, I'm assuming you mean the Battle of New Orleans. Um, if not, go ahead and, and, and type that to me, which one you're talking about. But there were ships involved in the Battle of New Orleans because it's right there, right along the Mississippi River. And so the Americans had um, a couple of ships that participated to help stop the British from getting to the city. Uh, the, the British were able to destroy one of them, but another ship just sort of stayed right there and at all the right times, and, and they were able to use the opportunity to, to fire into the sides of the British Army. This was a very, a very uh, effective fire. Uh, during that night battle that I talked about, they were able to fire into the British forces. And so those two ships, even though they were not engaged in fighting other ships along the Mississippi, had a big, big impact on the Americans' ability to fight against the British at New Orleans. I can put a picture in there. Yeah. So you can see what they look like. So I've got these two ships right here. Yeah, well, cool. so... So these are some of the bigger ships. I think this is the Constitution and maybe the, the Guerriere. Uh, these are some of the larger ship battles that took place out in the ocean. Remember I said that the American Navy actually tended to do a good job against the British, and this is one of those, those great battles. Um, I don't know which one. I, I'm not good enough to know which ship this is. But the Constitution um, and, and those ships were able to fight against British ships of equal size and they won almost every time. Okay. Let's see. Um, do we know how many people died in the War of 1812? We do know how many people died. Um, I, of course, don't know off the top of my head. I do know that more people, as, as with wars at this time, more people tended to die of disease than from actual wounds sustained in battle. And, and especially during the American forces, you have the militia who were coming from all over the country and getting together in large groups of people for the first time. This is the opposite 
of social distancing, right, and stay in place. They're all coming together in one big gathering, and they start spreading disease like crazy. So I know that estimates of American deaths due to disease are perhaps as high as 15,000 during the course of the war. Ah, the question is, did any women fight or serve in the war? Not that I personally am not going to be involved in combat, but they are going to be involved in campaigning. Uh, and sometimes that's just as hard as actually having to do a lot of the fighting. All right. Uh, let's see. I'd like to know the range of the rifles for the other muskets. Right. Oh, so, yeah, the question is, what is the range of the muskets? So it's important to make the, the distinction... We're talking about two different types of weapons. We're talking about muskets, which is what I have, which is what the soldiers had. It's a smooth bore. That means it's just like a pipe on the inside. There's, there's, there's nothing in there that shoots a round ball. Uh, there's a rifle, and on the inside of the tube, instead of being smooth, it's got grooves cut that spin that are like a spiral groove that go down the path of the barrel. The advantage to the rifle is that it makes that bullet spin, so it makes it much more accurate, and it can make that bullet shoot further when it's being more accurate. So an accurate rifle shot might be as much as 150, 200 yards. Uh, with a, with, in the hands of a really good marksman, maybe even more than that. Uh, the musket is not going to be able to be that accurate. An effective range for the muskets is about 50 to 75 yards because that ball moves around in that in that smooth barrel and doesn't spin. It's like the difference between throwing a soccer ball and throwing a football. That's exactly the kind of mechanics you're talking about. The problem is to load a rifle takes about one minute for one shot. And most rifles at this time do not accept this bayonet. So if soldiers start to get too close to you, the riflemen are going to have to run away because they don't have that kind of weapon. The musket does have a bayonet and you're able to load that musket three and if you're really good four times a minute. So you're able to shoot much more often and the balls, the lead balls that are shot from a musket tend to be bigger so they can also cause more damage. So those are sort of the differences between the two different types of weapon and how far they can shoot. Oh, the, the plate? Yes. All right, yeah, so Eden wants to know what the design on my, my Shaco is. So let me get a little bit close. Uh, you can see this is a standard infantry plate that goes on the Shaco. You can see it's got that classic American eagle there. That, most, of, uh, most of the American symbols from this time, the, the belts, the plates, things like that, are going to have an American eagle on it. That's what that plate is. And of course, you know, the inside of it is just a, just real basic. It's got this shape to the side, but the, the dangly parts, the cord in the front, the plate, the pom-pom here on the side are all about just making a, this is, this is not meant to be practical. This is meant to be soldierly and dashing looking. Um, that's why it's like that. Ah, so the question is, are there any uh, American ships from the War of 1812 still in existence? Yes, there is. Uh, one of the most famous ships in naval history, the USS Constitution, which was built um, very early on in the 1790s. Well, it was started to be built in the 1790s and was finished. It was, this was when President Washington uh, was still in, in, his, in office, and he wanted to help create this navy. So the Constitution was one of six frigates that was built to be, basically be the American Navy. And that is the ship that was perhaps the most famous from the War of 1812. It's called Old Ironsides because in its battle with the British ship, so, sailors would look out and they saw British cannonballs literally bouncing off the side of the ship mostly because the ship was so thick, the, the side was so thick, and it was made of live oak, which is a very, very strong oak that coincidentally, you can only get that in Georgia. So a lot of what makes Old Ironsides Old Ironsides is because of that Georgia live oak. It still exists. It's up, uh, where is it? I think it's up in Boston. Um, 
and you can still visit that. I think that's where it was built. And it is the oldest existing commissioned warship in the world that's still afloat. Uh, so the question is, was it common for the ship to sink? And if, you know, how many were sunk? The war between Great Britain and America, we're not talking about big naval battles. Most of the naval battles are one-on-one -on -one ship or one-on-two or two-on-two, -two, something like that. Uh, in the Great Lakes, there may be some bigger actions, but even then you're still only talking about 10 or 15 ships. Um, when you're in the middle of a battle, when you're fighting a warship, you want to sink that ship because it's trying to sink you. But a lot of the naval combat in the War of 1812 wasn't warship to warship. It was warship to merchant ship, which is not really necessarily heavily armed. If it's armed at all, it's carrying goods across the ocean. And these sea captains would want to capture those, number one, because it would deprive the enemy of those supplies that the ship carried, and number two, any goods that were carried on those ships got to be kept, and the amount of money that they were worth was split up amongst the captain and the crew, which made them fight very hard and helped make a great many fortunes during the war. All right, folks, we have had a great time today talking to you about the War of 1812. Uh, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed this. As, uh, like I said, this is, this is one of the most fascinating time periods in, in early American history. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you can support us in any way and keep these programs going while everyone's at home, we would appreciate that. Just go to our website and click on that donate button in the upper right hand corner. But if you can't do that, one thing you can definitely do for us is tell all of the friends and all the family that you possibly can to tune into these broadcasts. Um, tomorrow we're going to be looking at some early American medicine right around this time and perhaps a little bit back into the um, colonial American history about what medicine was like and medical practices. But until then, stay safe and take care.